Welcome to the admissions q and I'm Karthik Ramana. I'm a professor here at the school and also the director of the Master of Public Policy. And we are delighted to have this forum where you can ask questions of our splendid admissions team on uh, the admissions process, on what to expect over the course of the next few months, and of course on the possibility of becoming part of our splendid family here at the Blavatnik School in the Oxford MPP. Let me say a couple of words about the MPP itself, the MPP experience. And I think if there's one phrase that describes what it means to be in the Oxford MPP, one phrase that describes the value of the Oxford MPP, I would choose building unlikely coalitions. So every year the MPP brings together somewhere between 120 and 140 individuals from across the globe, usually 60 to 70 different jurisdictions, spanning in age from the early 20s to perhaps the mid 50s. Uh, people who are passionate about a wide range of subjects from climate change, from inequality, from AI and tech and jobs of the future, uh, combating extremism. And part of the value of the MPP, part of the way in which the MPP will help you grow personally and become more effective uh, professionally is to help you build these unlikely coalitions with people that you might think you have nothing in common with, but as you think more deeply about it, as you get to know these individuals better, as you learn together, as you laugh together, as you uh, go through the examination process together, you will find yourself learning a lot about individuals, how to work effectively in teams, how to drive teams to get jobs, un un wicked problems solved, unlikely problems solved. And that's the part of the MPP that I really want you to look forward to. And that's the part of the MPP that will last with you, hopefully, for a lifetime. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Master of Public Policy Admissions Q&A. My name is Megan Gregg, and I am the Campaigns and Marketing Manager for the Blavatnik School of Government, and I will be moderating today's event. We are very pleased to have three incredibly knowledgeable members of the admissions team on the panel today. I'll be asking them some initially, initial frequently asked questions before moving on to questions from the audience. So make sure to put your questions in the Q&A section within Zoom and upvote any you think are particularly valuable. And now, without further ado, let's introduce the experts. Kim. Hello. Um, I am, uh, sorry, uh, hello, sorry. I'm Kim Edwards. I'm the Senior Admissions Officer here at the Blavatnik School of Government. Um, I oversee the administrative um, side of the admissions process. And today I'm going to be particularly answering questions regarding scholarships and funding and more general admissions questions. I've been at the school, I, I've been here at the school three and a half years and I've been in Oxford for 15 years. Hi, um, I'm Beatrice, I'm the admissions assistant, and I support Kim throughout the admissions process with a particular focus on processing applications and things like English language and transcript questions. And I've been working um, with Kim in admissions for about a year now. Hi, my name is Ruth. I work closely with Kim and Beatrice, but my main focus is on our brand new MSc in Public Policy Research course and the Public Policy One Plus One program. Um, I've been working at the school for about two years now. Um, thank you so much for joining this event and it's lovely to see everybody. Okay, so first question going over to Kim. So what is unique about the Blavatnik School of Government MPP program and how does it differ from other MPP programs? So I think there's probably three main areas where the MPP uh, here at the Blavatnik School of Government is quite different. Um, firstly, it's kind of the global nature of the program. Secondly, the content of the course. And thirdly, coming here to Oxford uh, as a place to study. So as Karth in terms of the global side, uh, as Karthik mentioned, 
Um, the cohort are truly global. They come from across the world uh, and therefore our alumni are now across the world as well. And that's an essential part of the experience of being on the course. And it also impacts other parts of life here at the school. So um, we in the last in 2020, we, we received six million pound in research funding. And that was for our faculty to do research for governments and NGOs where they are going out um, and doing research, which has a real impact on people's lives across the world. It's highly international where our research is focused. Um, so we do have expertise in uh, Europe, the UK, the US, but we also have uh, expertise well beyond that, whereas um, in Africa, Asia, South America, uh, whereas many other MPPs are, are more focused uh, perhaps on, on the developed world. Um, so, and in terms of content, the content of the course, so it's a 12 month program. It's a highly intense 12 month program. So we fit within that 12 months, what many other courses would do in 18 months to 24 months. Uh, it's multidisciplinary, so economics, law, philosophy, our faculty come from a whole range of backgrounds. Uh, there's a huge amount of contact time in the MPP as well. There's a lot of face-to-face -face, um, contact with faculty. Uh, and it's a generalist course. Um, so this is for people from a whole range of backgrounds and it's teaching you skill sets to then have a real world impact. Uh, whereas some MPP courses are more um, focused, for example, on, on one particular area, such as economics, some, some of the MPP courses are. Um, this is very much a generalist from people from a whole range of backgrounds who are looking for a generalist education in terms of public policy. Uh, and finally, Oxford University, we are obviously a part of Oxford University, uh, and which has been ranked as the best university in the world by the Times for, I think, five years now. Um, there's 900 years of history. It's famed for its innovation and its research excellence. Um, and you've got the whole experience of coming to Oxford. So as well as joining us as a department, you would be part of a college and a part of the wider university. And many of our students really love the experience here in the department, and that is their main focus. But you've also got the option of engaging in college life. You've also got the option of all the societies, all the experience of being part of Oxford University more widely. Um, and it's a beautiful and a historic city. It's a lovely, interesting, vibrant place to live. So that's what I would say are the three areas where it's really unique, the global nature, the content, and the experience of studying here at Oxford. Thanks, Kim. So over to Beatrice. What does a typical MPP candidate look like? So both our applicant pool and our student cohort are always incredibly diverse. This is because there's no set level of experience required of applicants or professional background, particular um, degree background required. This is because we want our students to be able to learn from each other just as much as they learn from faculty. There's a huge range of professional backgrounds that our students and applicants come from, including engineering, medicine, and education, journalism, and some more directly political careers. The average age this year of our students is 29 years old, but we have a range from 29, 21 to 49 years of age, and the majority of our students are international with more than 50 nationalities represented in our cohort this year. So essentially there isn't a single uh, student or applicant profile for our MPP, they're all incredibly diverse. However, there are some things that all the successful MPP applicants will have in common, and that's in relation to our selection criteria, which are strong academic record to date, commitment to public service, and evidence of leadership and impact. So I would say that there isn't a specific profile that our applicants or students have, but they will all have these three things in common. Amazing. So we also wanted to cover a bit about our public policy one plus one program and the brand new MSC, which is why we have Ruth here today. So Ruth, how do you actually apply for the public policy one plus one program? And do those interested need to apply to both the MPP and the MSC? That's a great question. So the first answer is yes, um, you need to apply for both the MPP and the MSC. So I think the first thing to do is really look at the entry requirements on the graduate admissions website. Make sure that you read through what each course is asking for. Look at what supporting documents um, you need to submit for each one and make sure that in your personal statement, you really state clearly that you want to be considered for the public policy one plus one application. I would also encourage you to really tailor your personal statement to each course and remember that a different panel of assessors will be looking at your MPP application and the MSc application um, so it's important to make sure that you get um, your skills across for each course. 
Thank you, Ruth. Okay, Beatriz, I'm going to come to you now. Um, so we've got some questions about the GRE and what is really required? Do we need a GRE? What about sort of um, alternate versions of the GRE? So what about an LSAT score or um, you know previous degree programs? Does any of that count? Yep. Um, so that's a very common question that we get and scores from tests such as the GRE, the GEMMA or the L LSATs are not required at all to complete your application. Um, you're not at any disadvantage if you haven't taken these tests or if you're not submitting your results. Um, however, if you have taken the test and you got good results and you think that would look nicely in your application, you are more than welcome to add it to your application. Um, but it's definitely not a requirement and none of the applicants that do not submit it will be at any disadvantage for that. Great, thank you. So let's go back to Kim. What about the supporting documents? I mean, are they going to be examined as a whole or will they be looked at separately? You know, do, do you need to have key information in every single one of the documents or can they be, you know, will they be looked at as, as a whole? Uh, in terms of the supporting documents, I guess that's talking about the written work that people submit for the MPP. Um, so I think the key thing um, is to think about um, the three areas that Beatrice mentioned. So the applications are assessed on the basis of three uh, criteria, academic excellence, evidence of leadership and impact, and evidence of public service. And it's not that one part of your application is, for every part that's submitted for your application, we'll be looking at all of those elements. So something like public service, which is one of those elements, they, they will be looking at your CV to see evidence of public service. They also might look at your, um, your, your personal statement though. They might look at your public service essay. So everything is, can't really be looked at separately. It's how your entire application together um, contributes towards evidencing those three areas of academic merit, evidence of public service and leadership and impact. Um, does that answer the question? I hope so. And I'm sure that uh, people will ask again if they have any further questions. Uh, coming back to you, Kim. Uh, but basically, someone's asking about reapplications. And I know we have had someone in the current cohort who did was successful after reapplying. So, you know, what advice do you have for re for those who are reapplying? And um, I mean, we always get a good number of applications from younger Younger, uh, younger applicants, so in their early 20s. And we do have students each year which are of around that age um, that needn't prevent you applying at all. But it is very difficult if you've only just graduated to really evidence those three elements. Um, you've not had perhaps the opportunity in terms of leadership and impact and public service that you will have when you've had a few more years experience. So the fact you've not been successful, perhaps when you're a little bit less experienced, um, does not mean you, you will not be successful uh, if you've then gone out and got additional experience, which will then enhance your application. Um, so we would very much encourage people to reapply. It's highly competitive every year we have to say no to many really really good candidates it's not um it's it, we just have limited spaces and we can't offer to everyone so we'd encourage people to reapply um on the basis that they have built some additional experience um and on the basis um they may want to rethink perhaps what they've submitted so perhaps we do you, when you reapply you have the option of using the same um public service essay personal statement they may want to review that see how they can strengthen it look again at what the criteria are for um for success and just try and perhaps hone it a bit more and reflect what you've done since you last applied so speaking to that beatrice i think you can be some help here we've got quite a few questions about transcripts and saying you know okay you've got programs require that you know the first class or strong up a second but you know what about if the undergrad isn't that, but sort of you've already got a master's and your master's is say first class. And another question is about, you know, what about uh, double degrees and how do you put those transcripts in? Some of those sorts of questions. Yep, so our um, selection requirements outline the requirement for a, a strong two, 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 one or first on your bachelor degree. 
we don't have any specific requirements for masters because our applicants don't need to have completed a masters before the MPP. However, your application is considered holistically. So if you have done a master's, it will also be considered along with, with your bachelor degree. Um, you are required to upload evidence and transcripts of every single degree that you've done, even if it's not a formal requirement of the MPP. Um, so even though there's no requirements for a master's, if you have one, we will look at it. And if those scores are good, that will obviously work in your favor. Um, and it, it will be considered holistically along with your bachelor results. If you have a slightly lower bachelor and a higher uh, master's degree, that would you know, work to your advantage because we consider all applications that we receive. And so even if your scores are below our requirements, you will still be considered holistically over the three selection criteria of obviously academic, um, academic record, but also uh, leadership and impact and commitment to public policy. So it's not, you know, an automatic no if your scores are slightly below what we require and it will all be considered as a whole. Uh, in terms of the dual um, degree question, uh, when you're completing your application, I don't think it hugely matters whether you list it as one degree or as two degrees, we'll be checking everything. So if there's anything that doesn't seem quite right, uh, we'll get back to you. But essentially, as long as you list your, higher de your highest degree to date, and whatever the name on your degree is um, and provide transcripts for all of your degrees, then that's definitely sufficient. And as I say, we check everything. So we'll be in touch if there's anything that we need clarification on. Don't know if I missed any of your questions. <laughs> I think that that was a good answer. So coming back to Kim, what is the balance like between practical application and research and theory on the course? I think it is, it's very much, so it is an academic course, but it's training you to, it's training you in an applied way. So you are looking, it's an academic course at Oxford University, but the focus of the course is enabling you to be practitioners. So the reason we need good academics is because you're going to be able, going to need to be able to absorb everything that you're receiving from our faculty in terms of knowledge and experience, things like looking at evidence, which then, so when you're looking at public policy, we're very much focused on ensuring that the money is best spent in the way that is genuinely going to have an impact. And so you're looking at what evidence there is um, to support um, outcomes in public policy and that kind of thing. So it's using academic research in order to have a real world impact. That's kind of the balance. Does that answer it? Yes, I think so. Gosh, we've got a lot of questions. <laughs> um, we've also had a question, which is probably for you, Kim, as well. But what are some of like the really common mistakes that we see coming through on applications and also particularly with the, the personal statement? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one thing that they are very interested in seeing is what trajectory are you on? What do you really want to do? If what you really want to do is come and do a master's at Oxford, that's probably not what we're looking for. We're probably looking for someone who wants to improve the world in some way and who then sees the master's of public policy as a way that they can make that change. So what are you passionate about in terms of public policy? Um, you know, are you passionate about the environment? Would you like to be able to make a change this way or this way? And how will the course enable you to get there? Um, so talk about how you've got where you are now and where you anticipate being in a few years and why the MPP is the right course for you to get there. Um, so yeah, in your personal statement, uh, I, I mean, in terms of personal statements, I've seen them, they all look incredibly different and many of them are, you know, there isn't a right way to do a personal statement because it should be something that reflects you as a person. Um, so don't try and follow a rule book, but just be honest in terms of why you want to come and in what way you're hoping to have an impact once you leave the school. Great. So not sure who, who this goes to, but um, <laughs> basically we have a question about actually looking at the applications and how we go about sort of assessing them. And so Paola wants to know if 
applications that come in in late December or early January are disadvantaged at all, or you know if they are assessed on a rolling basis, and um, you know if if as long as you do it by the deadline, are you still uh, in with a good chance? I mean, I can reply. They they are all assessed in one batch. We don't have rolling applications, so the deadline is the seventh of January, um, and everyone will receive their their outcome towards the end of March. Um, what we would strongly encourage people to get their applications in perhaps before Christmas, um, because that enables us, if there's any issues with your, your application, that enables us to follow up with you. For example, if references haven't come in on time. So for the best possible chance of submitting your best possible application, it's probably wise to do it as early as you can. But in terms of how they're considered and processed within the school, uh, they are all considered together as long as you get it in by the deadline. Fantastic. We've also had a question about, you know, the the alumni, because we do have a fabulous alumni network at the school and it's it's a really great networking opportunity to be a part of that network. But what sort of engagement opportunities do the students get while you know they're here on the course? So pretty much from the beginning, there'll be some level of involvement from alumni. Our alumni are very involved in the school. Um, one of the most um, one of the earliest opportunities is basically just joining the alumni platform, which links you up with alumni across the world. And that is introduced to students in November. Um, but there'll also be other opportunities um, to connect. Um, alumni come and speak. Um, often if people, for example, when people go and do their summer project, they sometimes link up with alumni in the different countries. Um, I don't know, Ruth, if you have anything further to say about contact with alumni, because um, Ruth used to work within the programs team that supports the course. One thing to mention is the alumni community hub. So you'll be inducted into a hub which has all of the countries of people that we've connected with since the school was founded in 2010. Um, so you have access to really filter by region, by research, by interest, and you can really link up with somebody um, who might be able to offer advice to you. Um, there's also alumni events running throughout the year as well, where alumni can talk to current students. Um, you can also buddy up with alumni as well. Um, they do a lot of work. Awesome. Beatrice, I think this can come to you. <laughs> um, in terms of work experience, you know, what sort of importance is placed on, say, going and, and studying and having previous degrees, as opposed to, say, someone who's worked in public service for the last 10 years? And if, say, someone has been working for a really long time, how do they go about getting those academic references? Yep. So as I mentioned, our um, successful applicants are just uh, wildly diverse. We have people that are in their early 20s and they're just out of education, so they might not have a lot of work experience. And we have uh, older applicants who have been working for a very long time. Uh, neither of those kind of profiles would be at any disadvantage, because as I said, we want our cohort to be as diverse as possible so that everyone can learn from each other. Um, so there is no requirement for work experience uh, specifically, uh, as long as you, you know, you still have some evidence of our selection criteria, so of uh, being committed to public service and to have the ability to have leadership and impact in the future, then you wouldn't be at any disadvantage for not having work experience. Um, in terms of older applicants who might have been out of education for a very long time, again, that's not a disadvantage. We, we often have older applicants. Uh, currently, our age range is 21 to 49 years of age. Um, so not a disadvantage to have been out of education for a long time. Uh, but you do still need to have uh, transcripts from your study because it is a very intense academic master's. And so you need to be able to evidence that um, you know, you have the academic abilities to complete it and you will need to have at least one academic reference that can, you know, speak to the fact that you have been in higher education and that it went well. Um, but you won't be disadvantaged at all, whether you have, you know, not very much work experience or whether it, you've been out of education for a very long time. Thanks, Beatrice. Um, I think this one for Kim. Um, basically, someone's wanting to know if the course is, you know, really focused on policy or does it consider, you know, other elements of government work? So commercial finance, project management, you know, is it, how broad is it? 
Um, it is broad, as I mentioned, it's generalist. Um, and therefore, so there's there's quite a lot uh, in terms of the content, in terms of things like philosophy, economics, law. Uh, there's elements of statistics, I believe they do. They they look at applied applied policy. They look at um, specific ish case studies uh, and how um, and, and the application of that. Um, it's a, it's quite a broad course, I would say, generally, it's looking to give you a whole toolbox of skills that if you're going on to be a leader in government or in NGOs or whichever organisation, you'll have this whole toolbox of skills um, in terms of public speaking, in terms of writing, in terms of understanding how to get things implemented, how to make change, how, we, how to um, actually have an effect where you are. Um, so, yes, I always feel like I'm slightly veering off your question, but I would say it, it's a broad course that covers uh, quite a lot of um, th that's looking at somewhat many. Everyone comes in at a slightly different stage with a different kind of experience. And we're looking to give you a toolbox of skills, which can then lead you out to have an impact in public policy. Just to add to that, Kim, I don't know if it's helpful, but um, in Trinity term, you're offered um, over 21 different options. Um, and that's really the time where you get to um, choose where you want to specialise in. So we've had modules running on energy, climate change, um, private finance, managing organisations, communications. And it's so diverse, <laughs> um, over 21 different modules to choose from. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> So we've had some questions about scholarships. Um, and so Rohit's asking if they've not applied for an external scholarship beforehand, you know, are there central funding opportunities available? So there are three main sources of scholarships. Um, and so a good number, first of all, just to say that a lot of our students come on scholarships. So this year, 60% of our MPP students came on scholarships, 82 came on full scholarships, 82% came on full, uh, came on either full or partial. Um, and they are, um, they come from three main sources. So external, which will include employers, Chevening, UK government funding, and various other smaller ones. Um, just to mention, Chevening is one of our biggest with uh, 20 scholarships this year. Um, so the next lot is Oxford University. Um, Oxford University, by just applying to the course, um, you will be considered for most university scholarships. Um, so that includes um, a whole range of often defined by nationality, and you can see more about them on the Oxford University website. I would say the one scholarship um, to really take note of that you have to put in a separate application for is the Weidenfeld Hoffman Scholarship. And for that, you, um, we had seven of our 141 students were funded by Weidenfeld Hoffman this year. So that's worth putting an application in for um, if you're eligible. Um, and then the third lot, the third kind of section of scholarships is school scholarships. Uh, and how you're considered for that is if you receive an offer, you will receive, along with your certificate of offer, a link to the scholarship questionnaire. And that's your opportunity to say uh, how much funding you require and what you, um, and also to fill in paragraphs about different scholarships, effectively to apply for different scholarships. Now, there's no guarantee, certainly, that that will result in funding. Um, and it really is, it really does come down to the individual in terms of, make, of doing everything they possibly can to get funded. But there's kind of those three stages where there's the opportunity. And in terms of how the funding is split, um, generally, it's about a third each way. So about a third external scholarships, about a third university scholarships and about a third school ones. However, this year, um, it was slightly larger, the external scholarships. So it's certainly worth seeing every, uh, looking at all the scholarship options available. And the first starting point for that really would be our website, the fees and funding page. Just have a look, go through the list and look at every single scholarship and see if you're eligible. And if you are eligible, how you apply for that. Some deadlines have passed, um, but um, there's still lots that haven't. Okay, what about when it comes to work placements for the summer project? I mean, what sort of support do students get on the programme for securing the right kind of, of work placement? 
So for the summer project, it is ultimately the responsibility of the student to find the summer project, but the school provides a lot of support around it. So if you come on programme um, during the first couple of weeks, you'll have a talk about the summer project and a bit more information about it. And then you'll have an opportunity. So there's various things. You have the opportunity to meet one to one with the summer project manager um, who can just talk through with you what your thoughts are about your summer project. They also, there's sessions that are run, things like networking events uh, between students to talk about what opportunities students are aware of, which they could perhaps share with other students um, about summer projects. Um, there's, there's opportunities that are advertised through the university career service, and there's opportunities that are run through the school as well. Um, I've got a few that were advertised this year. So the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, um, which is part of the UK government, advertised an opportunity. UNESCO, IFC, which is part of the World Bank and the World Health Organization were a few of the organizations that advertised opportunities. So these are advertised. You then apply for them, uh, potentially submit an a short application. Often there's an interview and potentially that can result in a summer project. So it is your responsibility to find the summer project. Um, and that's partly because students want to do such different things for their summer project. But the school provides a great deal of support to enable you to, um, to, to get the kind of summer project you're hoping to. OK, a question about uh, personal essays and statements and things like how do people actually really get across evidence for some of those softer skills that you might be looking for. So leadership skills, for example, you know, what what is a really good way for them to include those in their statements? I think it's just about looking back to see what you've done in your in your career, but then outside your career as well. So what have you done? Um, obviously, this can be a bit more of a challenge for applicants who have less years of experience. Um, and so if that's the case, you might want to think about what you've done on a voluntary basis, what you've done out, outside of your education or work that could be evidencing public service that where you it looks very different for different people, I think, potentially. Um, but, yeah, it, it is something, although you're not at a disadvantage by having not had that much work experience, it does make it a bit more challenging you might have to think a bit more deeply in terms of what you've done but it's certainly not it doesn't come down to just paid experience it can be things outside of that so I want to come to Ruth and just ask a question about the one plus one so because this is brand new and this will be like the first year people can apply to do the MPP followed by the MSC I mean what if if you want to apply for that one plus one is it the same application? How does that work? Um, so it's a separate application. So you need to apply for the MPP um, first and then the MSC, there are two application routes. And then state clearly, as I said earlier, in your personal statement that you want to be considered for the public policy one plus one. Um, so applicants who are accepted on to the public policy one plus one program will do the MPP in 2022 and then the MSC um, in 2023. They have to be in that consecutive um, route. So, if, for example, if you wanted to take a gap year, um, have a year apart, I'd really encourage you to apply for the MPP first and then come back um, and then apply for the MSC separately. Um, it's important, again, as I stressed earlier, to really tailor your personal statement to the um, application requirements on the website. So for example, your notice at the MPP asks for a policy essay, whereas the MSC asks for a research proposal. Um, the MSC um, criteria, which um, I think Kim briefly discussed is slightly different. So they're looking at academic and analytical excellence, strong commitment to public service, and a clear motivation to improve public policy through research. For the MSC side of the application, it's really important these three things come through in your personal statement, your references, and also that supporting written work as well. Could I just add, as we're talking about the one plus one, about the financial side of it? So um, the one plus one can be a really good option for people who come with two years of funding. So certain governments fund for that and the Rhodes Scholarship does. Um, for people where um, funding is a concern and an issue, it can be wiser to apply for the MPP initially and then during that year apply for the MSC. The reason for that is I talked earlier about the three areas of scholarships. One of those areas is university scholarships. And for university scholarships, you will only be considered in the year you apply. 
Um, so you'll only be considered if you applied for the MPP and the MSc this coming cycle, you'd only be considered for university scholarships for the MPP element of the course. You wouldn't be considered for the MSc, even though you're doing that the following year. So because of that, we'd suggest that if you need a scholarship to come um, and if you don't have funding arranged, that you initially just apply for the MPP and that then when you're on the MPP, you then apply for the MSc. Thanks, Kim. Good tip. Uh, Beatrice, I want to come back to you about references. Um, I know you spoke a little bit about this before, but do you have any specific sort of suggestions basically for people who have finished their degree quite some time ago, they're no longer in touch with any of their lecturers, they're not really sure how to find or, or procure those academic references? Mm -hmm. Yep, so we know that for some of our older applicants or applicants that haven't been in education for a few years, it can seem tricky getting those references and we get a lot of inquiries asking, oh, can I just have three professional references? The answer is no, you must have at least one academic reference. And um, although that might seem, you know, like it wouldn't be helpful to your application, uh, the master's, the MPP is a master's and it is an academic course and you need to be able to show that academically uh, you have previously, you know, have a good track record. Uh, so you must have an academic reference. Um, for candidates that aren't in touch with any of their, you know, lecture supervisors and so on, um, you can really just email your uh, previous institution, your department, and get references um, from a course director or something that still has records of your, st uh, your stay at their institution. Um, it may seem like that doesn't add value to your application. You might think, oh, well, my, I don't know, my manager at work would give me a better application. Um, but that is still a formal requirement that you must meet. And you are able, if you want, to have more than three references if you want to add a fourth one. Um, but you must have that academic reference. And every year we have applicants that have been out of education for 20, even more years, and they still manage to get one. Um, I, I think I saw a question saying, oh, will I be impacted negatively if I don't have an academic reference? Unfortunately, the answer is yes, because you wouldn't have been following our requirements. If you don't have an academic reference, we will get back to you and we'll ask you to please add one. And, you know, you you kind of will be very, uh, very much asked to do so because it is one of our formal requirements. Um, your other two or more references can be professional, but we would advise that they're always uh, people that are in a position to comment on your academic abilities. So things like your analytic abilities and, and such. Um, but yes, at least one of them has to be academic in nature. And if you have completed a master's in the past, it must be from your master's. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind. Okay, I think this one is also for you, Beatrice, um, about transcripts and, you know, if the institution was not an English language institution, what do you do about transcripts that aren't in English? Yep, so um, as we mentioned, so many of our applicants are international, so this comes up really often and it's the case for a lot of our applicants. If your degree, uh, if your institution doesn't um, produce your transcripts in English, you'll need to get it uh, translated by an official um, authorized notary or translator. So you'll need to submit both the original in the original language, as well as the certified translation. Um, it's up to you to find the translator in your home country or whatever the services are there, but essentially it needs to be verifiable. So it needs to be stamped, signed, and there has to be some reference to who the translator is. Um, we won't accept a, a transcript that you've translated yourself, you know, typed up. It has to be um, a verified professional translator. Okay. Um, you've sort of touched on this before, Kim, but uh, we've got some questions around like how one actually goes about sort of narrowing down what their focus is on the program, because obviously, yes, it is very general and it's wide and we can study a lot of things, but also you can sort of narrow your focus and, and sort of specialize. So how does that work within the program? There's two elements at which you can, there's two parts where you have, um, you can select 
uh, what courses you go to within the programme, which are the applied policy modules, uh, of which I believe Ruth may correct me on this. I think there are about nine of these and students choose around three. Um, and these are, so I have some examples, behavioural science and decision making, negotiations in public policy, communication of public policy, statistic for public policy, private finance, managing organisations. So you can choose three of those. And obviously you'll probably partly choose based on the subject area, but you may also be interested, depending on who's delivering the um, sessions, um, different faculty who may have more overlap in terms of your area of interest. So you get to choose three of those, in, which I think are delivered throughout the year. And then the options module, which happened towards the end of the year, where I, and in the example from 2020, we had 21 different options module of which you could choose two. So there is that ability to specialize um but there that of the modules within the course those are the two where you can the other modules are um are, are not there, there aren't options within those um Ruth do you want to say anything more about the program itself in terms of how people can specialize I think lots of people change um from working with students last year they come in with a vision and think this is what I want to do this is what I want to be and then they talk to their supervisors and realize actually I'm really interested in this I'm going to um take this module instead and they're actually surprised um surprise themselves some people come in with a very clear path um but other times students really develop that pathway as they go through the course I'd also um want to highlight the number of events going on at the school as well. Um, so every week we've got different people coming in, um, visiting, and that sometimes having those conversations with people on the ground working in government can also sway um, decisions about what they want to do and go on to study. It might yes. be worth mentioning here as well, the professional skills program, which is delivered as part of the MPP. It's not an assessed element of the program, but it involves having all sorts of speakers from across the world come in. So you can get speakers from um, we've had speakers from the World Bank. We've had speakers, former prime ministers within the UK. I think we had a former Swiss prime minister the other year. We certainly had not a former Australian prime minister um, who ended up. Uh, it was a very busy time of year. So actually, uh, the, most of the students couldn't come. So you had about seven Australian students who all had this kind of very small group meeting with a former prime minister of Australia. And that's a fantastic opportunity to really discuss how the career that he's had and that kind of thing. And as Ruth said, there's so many of these sessions happening throughout the year. The idea isn't that everyone goes to all of them the idea is that you look at that schedule and you pick out what really interests you and there's also um there's as well as within the school there is also stuff within Oxford more broadly uh which many students choose to engage in because that's what they're particularly interested in yeah and I, I I'll just say as well that the whole of Oxford has an incredible convening power when it comes to getting speakers just at the university as well so you aren't just limited to your your uh, amazing events within the school you can also have access to all the wonderful and incredible events and speakers that they have across the university which is a real perk so what about the policy brief as part of the application are there any tips or, or thing tricks or or i don't know common mistakes that you see with applications and any advice for people with their writing their policy brief I'm not sure that I have any thoughts on this. Beatrice, do you have any thoughts on the policy brief? Uh, not particularly. I think we don't have any specific guidance in terms of content and format because everyone um, has such different, um, you know, particular interests that they have. So some people uh, will choose a very specific issue, things like, I don't know, climate, uh, climate change, education in their particular home country and so on. So it's very much up to you to decide what um, policy issue you want to focus on. And that's why we don't really have any formal guidance on the topic, because it's really up to you whether you want to do it at a global scale, national scale, or even, even more specific than that. Um, so there's really no wrong topic or no wrong policy brief that you can write. You should really just choose something that you're passionate about, but that you also have enough knowledge about so that you can write a, a good piece of, of, of writing. Thank you. Good answer. Uh, I think this is one for Kim. I mean, so as part of the MPP, students will 
be also part of a college. So how, how do they decide which college to select or do they need to select a college and, and how does that process happen? Yes, so on your application form, you can choose to select a college. Um, that is an optional box, you don't have to. So I believe about half our applicants choose a college that they would prefer and about half don't. For the half that choose a college they would prefer, um, basically what that means is when you are, if you are accepted onto the course, you are guaranteed a college space. And if you've expressed a preference in terms of which college you would like to go to, then your application goes to that college first for consideration. Um, it, whether they accept you or not will be based on a whole range of things. They'll be looking for certain criteria. They'll be looking for a certain combination of people. Um, so you might then be accepted by that college. If you're not accepted, then you'll be sent out to another college to consider. Um, and yeah, uh, but eventually you will get offered a place. With the people who don't select a college, then it just goes round um, to whichever college um, accepts you. Um, and in terms of which college you choose, I mean, the colleges of Oxford vary a lot in terms of their character and history. So it might just be um, good for you to have a quick look at their websites. Um, so one thing to consider, I would say, is some colleges are graduate colleges. Um, that means that they only accept postgraduate students. So it depends how you feel about the young Younger. most undergraduate students will be 18 to 21 year olds if you'd rather avoid those then you can I would suggest you go to a graduate college or you might want a more mixed experience a more mixed community in which case you might want to choose one that's not a graduate college um, equally some are extremely old so university college Exeter College both um, we have students regularly there um, and they're very much hundreds and hundreds of years old or alternatively we've got Reuben College which is so new they're still building it um, so that's a whole different experience. For a few students, um, there can be funding opportunities linked to specific colleges. So it's worth looking on, again, the college websites to see. Uh, I know that we've had one recently, I think it was linked to Oriel College, but that is linked to a specific nationality. I um, can't remember off the top which nationality, I think it might be Afghan ladies. Um, but yeah, so look, uh, you might want to look at the colleges and if there might be a particular opportunity for you um, funding wise, that can be a reason people choose colleges as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's up to you if you choose a college or if you don't. While we're on the subject of funding, I mean, if if people say, well, I won't be able to come to the MPP without funding, is it still worth them applying to the programme? Yeah, I mean, very much so. As I say, 60% of our students receive full funding. And when I say full funding, I mean that they received our full course fees and they've received a contribution towards their living expenses um, for most of them. So it's definitely worth applying. What I would say is by being accepted on the course, there's no guarantee you'll get funding. So it's if you're dependent on funding to be able to come, there's going to be effectively two stages to the process. There's going to be your application to the MPP. Have you got in? wonderful if you have got in and then there's going to be the question over whether you can get funding uh, we normally most scholarships come out by uh, we we aim to get out as early as possible some come out over easter uh, the very latest come around out july august time and then the course begins late september so it's certainly worth applying um, and you can say on your scholarship questionnaire that you're not able to come without funding, but obviously the school has limited resources, um, there's limited scholarships, and uh, we certainly can't guarantee that you'll receive it, but we definitely recommend you apply. I, I would also say that certain scholarships are particularly keen on reaching people from less socioeconomically advantaged backgrounds. So, for example, the Lehman Scholarship um, particularly are keen to get um, students who may not be able to come to Oxford without funding to come. And similarly, as our scholarships, many of the scholarships are based on academics. That's the common thing within the university. But there is also an element within many, many scholarships, which is around need. So if you do come from a, a deprived background, then that can be a factor in terms of enabling you to come because we want people who are who meet all our who meet all of our criteria and who brilliant who are brilliant but may have had less advantaged backgrounds to be able to come. Beatrice, we also have a question about the one plus one with the MBA. So how does that change the application process for the MPP? Um, so for those of you that may not be aware, there is an MBA one plus one which is run by the side business school, which essentially enables you to um, do an MBA and another program of your choosing. 
Um, one option is the MPP, obviously. So in that case, you would need to apply to both the MPP uh, and the MBA separately. And you need to be accepted into both programs in order to be accepted for the one plus one MBA. Um, the application for the MBA is completely separate to the one for the MPP, and we don't look at your MBA application. Um, the side business school will assess one and we will assess the other one. And if you get accepted to both, then you're accepted to the one plus one program. Um, as, as ever, when applying to more than one program, you need to make sure that you're following the, the um, selection criteria and the entry requirements for both of the programs. They will be different. So the side business school will have different entry requirements than we do. And you should make sure that you're tailoring the application to both of them. Um, but essentially, you just need to apply to both of them separately. You don't need to disclose whether you're applying to the other one or not. We at the school only have access to the applications that you make for our programs. So we won't know that you're applying to the MBA and it won't affect your likelihood of getting in for the MPP. But yeah, so in short, you need to apply to both programs and need to be accepted into both programs. And then all of the running of the one plus one program is um, coordinated by the side business school. So if you have any specific questions about that, we would recommend that you get in touch with that department. Great. I think this one for Kim, uh, I don't know, or maybe Ruth, you might be able to help as well. So someone's asking us about how there's quite long breaks in between the terms. And, you know, is this when exams or projects generally take place or are there going to be, you know, a lot of coursework and things like that to do in between terms? You know, how does that structure work? Um, firstly, I'd say that the terms, the MPP terms are longer than the standard Oxford terms. So I'm not sure which on our website under um, the FAQs, there's a section that says what the MPP terms are. So there is about a month um, for Easter and about a month for Christmas I believe is that right Ruth <laughs> roughly yes um, yeah so um the exams for the MPP normally happen after Easter so my understanding is that that is quite a good time for um students to study um in anticipation of the exams um I think over Christmas again Ruth will probably know better on than this do you want to say um, so over Christmas, you'll normally be preparing for the upcoming apply policy modules that you'll take. So if you're doing an apply policy module in Michaelmas term, um, you might be preparing for the assessments just before Christmas. And then in January, you'll be preparing again for your apply policy assessments. Um, and then there's core modules as well that are running. So although it is time off over Christmas, um, lots of people do go away. I know students who have managed to catch some time um, in the UK over the Christmas period. You do get a break, but you are always sort of constantly preparing for the next assessment that's coming up. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so when we say this is an academically rigorous program, we mean it. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's very rewarding. So we're coming to sort of the end of our time here. So Beatrice, when sort of on average do people hear back about the outcome of their applications? Um, so the application deadline is the 7th of January. You have to have submitted your application and got all of your you know, uh, relevant documents in by then. And then we aim to release um, uh, all outcomes eight to 10 weeks later. So it's in mid to late March that all our applicants should be having an outcome. We'll be in touch via email. And yes, by, by the end of March, everyone should have gotten their um, results. <laughs> okay, we've had a few questions also just quickly about like, you know, is there a specific difference between the personal statement, statement of purpose, the, the personal essay, you know, what exactly is it that, that sets these things apart in the application? I'd say, I mean, the personal statement is very much a reflection. I, I mean, the best thing really to do, we could, is to look on the graduate admissions website. There's a better breakdown in terms of the detail of what we expect in each of the elements, but they are quite distinct, I would say. Um, the personal statement is going to reflect more on you and then the other two are more around academic writing but obviously all, as I say all the assessment criteria will be looking at all the evidence within the file so we'll be drawing from all, the whole file for each of those elements academic uh, excellence leadership and impact and public service 
will be um, everything you submit will be um, a factor in terms of how we assess your application for that. But we really um, would encourage you to look at the graduate admissions website and that has the full details about what you need to put in each of the elements for each of the um, submitted um, documents. OK, might be able to squeeze another in. Um, basically, we, we have a student who's worried about being an international student and, and what happens if they're not able to secure a work placement for their summer project. Don't worry about the summer project, really. It's absolutely fine. There are many, many opportunities, we would say, um, first of all. They look very different. So, for example, um, if people are interested in doing something more research based, so for example, some people have been in work for 20 plus years and they they want they, they come here, they do their MPP. What they want to do is spend time in Oxford doing research. They don't want to go out and work with a new organisation. And then um, they work with their supervisor or another member of faculty who's interested in researching something that they're interested in or in researching something the faculty member is interested in. There's all sorts of opportunities. The summer project is a really flexible thing it can develop you in the way that to some extent that you want to be developed so if you're if you're you're really wanting to get experience that's one thing if you're really wanting to do research that's another thing but there is no danger you 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 will end up with something as long as you're open to the different opportunities there are and there are lots of fantastic opportunities and there will be a lot of support people often come worrying about the summer project even prior to arrival and actually it's best to just wait till you arrive and then the summer project team will you know really tell you what your options are and you can begin applying for placements and looking at opportunities thank you so much panelists my experts uh here on on the mpp and the public policy one plus one um, if people have more specific questions to, you know given their particular um, circumstances, how should they go about getting those questions answered? You can just email the team. Um, so we are all accessible through the admissions inbox, admissions at bsg.ox.ac.uk. And I think after this presentation finishes, that will just um, be up on the screen for you to note down. Um, we're really very happy to reply to it by email. We can do calls if that's helpful, but we often find that doing it by email means that you've actually got it in writing so that you can refer back to it. So you've asked, we've had questions about the public policy essay and that kind of thing. If people really want more of a breakdown, feel free to email us. We have some standard information, which is, uh, reflects on the graduate admissions website information but expands on it slightly um, you're very welcome to email us and we can send that through to you amazing and yeah do definitely check out the uh mpp um faqs on the website which i believe have been sent shared in the chat um and we also Check it if you're interested at all in funding options. The fees and funding page on the website lists all the possible um, scholarships that are available. Please do you know have a look through each of them. They all have different requirements, all have different deadlines, but the information is all there for you. So do take a look. And thank you very much for coming today.